Hi everyone! Today we'll be talking about an artist on the Mount Rushmore of hip-hop, as you may be able to tell by my shirt. We're talking Dr. Dre. Now I've had the pleasure of spending the last two weeks listening to his discography to come up with the cream of the crop. I'm calling this, undeniably, the top 10 best Dr. Dre songs. And to stir things up a little bit, I'll have my pick for an overrated song at the end. But in the meantime, let's get to the top 10. To be clear, this list will be the best songs released by Dr. Dre under his name. So I'm not including songs produced by Andre Young. So you won't be seeing NWA or Eminem joints on this list. Feel free to tell me in the comments that In The Club deserves to be on his top 10. I'm listing the 10 best Dr. Dre solo tracks. The list starts with what Dre himself, at the time at least, called his final album. Certainly time will tell, and since then he's continued to produce for other artists. For the moment though, his third album, Compton, is his last. After 11 years working on the fabled album Detox, he would scrap that entire LP. And after being inspired on the set of the NWA biopic Straight Outta Compton, Andre would quickly record what he would refer to as a soundtrack with an eclectic cast of collaborators. With so many guests, Compton almost feels like a mixtape rather than a true follow-up to 2001. But it's an invigorating listen nonetheless. The album brims with black hippie spirit, with his golden prodigy Kendrick Lamar rapping on two songs, and his energy is all over the record. Talking to My Diary is the closing track, where Dre gives a career retrospective reminiscing about his rise over a head-bobbing sample with furious strings. He's in a surprisingly sentimental mood as he shouts out Ice Cube, MC Ren, and DJ Yella. Halfway through, it takes cues from To Pimp a Butterfly and morphs into jazzy trumpet flourishes, with the horn break further eulogizing Easy e and giving the song more gravity before snapping back into the beat. Talking to My Diary may not end up being the swan song for Dr. Dre, but if it is, he couldn't have scripted it any better. It's a victorious Hollywood ending. Yeah, and you don't stop. Cause it's one late seven on an undercover car. Andre began his production career after first becoming a DJ at an LA club called Eve After Dark. In the back was a four track studio where he began to work on songs with DJ Yella. He would join the electro hop group World Class Wrecking Crew and score a few regional hits before disbanding. Once Dre met O'Shea Jackson, aka Ice Cube, he would be recruited for Easy es Ruthless Records, becoming part of the seminal rap supergroup NWA. While their legacy looms large in the hip-hop world, they did not last very long. Royalty and money disagreements would lead Ice Cube to leave the group, and shortly after, Dre felt the same disrespect from the label. After his partner Suge Knight and his goons intimidated Easy e into releasing Dre from his ruthless contract, he and Knight would start a new label, Death Row Records. Dre's first solo single on DR would be Deep Cover, the theme song to the movie of the same name, starring Lawrence Fishburne, that involves a cop who goes undercover to infiltrate a drug cartel. The song, mainly written by the young and hungry Snoop Doggy Dog, follows the same story, only told from the gang perspective. Also known as 187, the numeric police code for murder in California, the duo trade hard rhymes while Colin Wolf plays a fretless, meandering bass line, with Dre's programmed in-the-pocket snare thumping along with his dissonant piano stabs. While he's billed as the guest, 20-year-old Snoop pretty much steals the spotlight, singing the hook and flowing with agility over Dre's eerie atmospherics. Filled with menacing sonics and gritty rhyming over a swinging beat, Deep Cover was the banging beginning of the illustrious partnership between the Doctor and do G. Shell, so I make it understood. Stay back, lay back, way back in the cut. NWA had made a big impact, but no one anticipated Dr. Dre's debut solo tip to make the seismic waves it did. The Chronic became a cultural phenomenon, pushing gangster rap from the inner city to the suburbs. And with the white kids buying the records, there was plenty of moral panic over the lyrics. The words almost beg for controversy, littered with violence, homophobia, and misogyny. Dre was hardly the only rapper who peddled nasty rhymes. It was rampant among his contemporaries, many of which insisted gangbanging was simply part of their daily reality. Still, the words can't help but leave a bitter taste sometimes, especially in light of the assaults against women that Andre has committed. While he has repeatedly apologized and seemed very sincere, there's no doubt that his violent actions stain his reputation. It's a sobering reminder that those artists you may idolize for their creative contributions are still just imperfect human beings like the rest of us. While the language may have been questionable, Dr. Dre's production remains undeniable. 
He turned G-Funk into an unstoppable movement, and his greatest masterstroke was not simply relying on samples, he always had a trusty team of collaborators on call to jam out his ideas. Dre would say by having live musicians replicate melodies and instrumentation, he was able to truly control the tempo and vibe. On Ratatat, Dre dug the dusty break out of his record collection, utilizing Lou Donaldson's jazzy instrumental, Hot Belly, and Snoop Dogg's cousin, Daz Dillinger, chopped it up on the sampler. Studio ace Colin Wolf plays both the deep, thumping bass and the circular, ringing guitar lick. The beat bumps, while the minor key melody paints an uneasy picture of a young gun living among the wild, concrete jungle, with the chorus repeating a rhythmic scat that approximates an automatic rifle unloading. Paired with the head nodding rhythm, the danger is only more alluring. Ratatat is a hard edge street banger that emphasizes the gangsta and G Funk. Dre's perfectionism led to many incredible songs. On the flip side, it almost seemed like a self imposed curse. Since founding Aftermath Entertainment, he's worked on intriguing albums that have never seen the light of day, including a full length with Snoop, another with Ice Cube, a joint album with production heavyweight Timbaland, and even an NWA reunion. All of which seem like easy album of the year contenders, if they ever dropped. Yet above even those was Detox, the Locked in the Vault follow-up to 2001 that he spent over a decade working on. In 2014, an in-house producer for Aftermath, Dewan Parker, said a gobsmacking 300 beats had been created specifically for the album. Dre himself would reveal at least 20 to 40 tracks were basically finished, but didn't measure up to his standards, which seems ludicrous, knowing some of the songs included hip-hop legends such as RZA and Jay-Z. I know there are some unfinished versions to be found around the net, but come on, Andre, you've already put in years of work. It's finally time to officially put it out. Let us hear Detox properly. Kush was meant to be on Detox, and Dre would reluctantly agree to release it only after an unfinished version had already leaked online. Some might call that leaker a hero. It spurred Dre to release his first single in nine years. The futuristic pulsating beat came courtesy of DJ Khalil, who rose to the challenge when the doctor came calling for a single, looping a catchy hook he had from singer Kobe Honeycutt. and layering intricate layers of buzzing synthesizers around it. Dre sounds vintage, rapping over the pounding piano about his favorite subject, some high-grade sativa, all while he puff-puff passes it to Snoop and Akon, who keep the high going. Kush was a club-ready electro smoke session that gave a tantalizing glimpse to a criminally unfinished record. Yeah, nine deuce, Dr. Dre. That would be the PG-rated title for the radio single of the song F with Dre Day and everybody's celebrating. True to its title, the music is a boisterous block party made for getting down to, but it's also served with a serious side of beef. Dre did not hold back, responding to diss tracks from both Tim Dog and Luke Campbell, formerly of Two Live Crew, and also continuing the jagged attacks he started in NWA against Ice Cube. Among all those lyrical shots, he saved his most vicious barks for Easy e Dre had been producing most of the artists on Ruthless Records, but he didn't think he was seeing his paper stack upright, and blamed the label's poor management, namely Easy and his business partner Jerry Heller. Still raw from feeling wronged, he ferociously targets his former homie, not only in the cutting bars, but also in the music video that he directed himself. The clip is a thinly veiled parody of the situation that would probably warrant a lawsuit nowadays. It features a rapper named Sleazy E, decked out in jerry curls that does the dirty work for a fat white man who owns useless records. As the story progresses, he becomes homeless and ends up on the side of the road holding a will rap for food sign. It's not exactly a flattering portrayal. So there is certainly raging fire when Dre spits Used to be my homie to be my ace now nah, i want to slap that six down your map but delivered over woofer rattling boom bap and delirious bernie worrell synthesizers you'd be forgiven for mainly focusing on the intense groove riding a jamming bass line interpolated from funkadelic's hood classic not just knee deep the rhythm is unstoppable and paired with brilliant bars from dre and snoop i can't help but think even easy's family would cop to bouncing to this joint Dre Day might be the best diss track of all time. It's a set it off party anthem that still bangs hard.
The DRE, the spectacular in a party I go for your neck, so call me Blackula. While it wasn't exactly written about, it was a fairly open secret that Dr. Dre didn't write most of his bars on his own. His primary focus was on production, which he excelled at. So when it came to rhyming, he often leaned on the great MCs around him. Ice Cube would write the bulk of Straight Outta Compton, and on The Chronic, several members of the Death Row family would ghostwrite some of his verses, including Snoop Dogg, RBX, and Corrupt, as well as the DOC, who wrote his own shout-out in Nothing But A G Thing, where Dre states, like my homie GOC, no one can do it better. Some associates do say he does write some of his lyrics, and when provided some ideas, he does give creative input to steer it into his own voice. His co-writers tend to write to his strengths, tough verses with a terse flow, but occasionally you'll hear the writer come through Dre's flow. It's no surprise that some of the verses on Compton sound suspiciously like Kendrick Lamar. Keep Their Heads Ringing, the lead single off the soundtrack for the movie Friday, would primarily be penned by DR associate Jay Flex. As a song with no guest stars at all, he really comes up clutch, with verses perfectly suited for Andre's cocky and aggressive personality. Make no mistake though, Dre still had to spit out the rhymes, and just like his beats, he delivers with authority. He boasts of his greatness, expertly flowing over a pulsating bass line, spacey electric piano, and a bopping break while Nancy Flex Fletcher's bell ringing hook makes sure the song gets stuck in your frontal cortex. Keep Their Heads Ring is a hypnotic, blunted joint where Dre shows off his striking solo chops and leaves his fans hungry for more. DRE from the CPT on a riding spree, a straight G. This is one of the joints off the chronic that explicitly links G funk to the P funk. Rather than simply borrowing samples and breakbeats from classic soul LPs, Dre's biggest innovation was to incorporate live instrumentation into the mixes, so he could use familiar melodies and reshape them into exciting new beats. He drew heavily from George Clinton's amazing Parliament Funkadelic Universe, co-opting solid gold hooks from both bands. The Wizard of Woo, Bernie Worrell's keyboard sonics really shaped the chronic in both the whirring treble synthesizers and the buzzing synth bass. Yet the songs are far from simply rhyming over the old school jams. Dre had ingested that potent P-Funk growing up, and his reverence leads to organic new grooves that took the intergalactic Funkonauts back down to Earth, swapping spaceships for tricked out lowriders, and taking the one and putting a gangsta lean on it. Let Me Ride would interpolate one of Parliament's greatest jams, Mothership Connection, and on the extended remix of the song, Dr. Funkenstein himself would even show up. Studio savant Colin Wolf once again kills on the track, playing a fat rolling bass line, along with a tight new jack swing of the booming snare, while spacey keyboards give a heady, smoky ambiance. The soulful chorus is sung by Jewel and Ruben Cruz, singing and and later are joined by the ghost of the immortal Glenn Goines on the breakdown, with his bellowing tenor lending even more otherworldly depth. While he still notes he's packing heat in his 6-4, Dre raps with a more laid-back cadence, and with the bumping mellow groove, he sounds like a man on a mission in search of freedom and peace of mind. Let Me Ride is an addictive, funky, fresh street classic, perfect for a smoke sesh cruising down the avenue. <laughs> You know I'm mobbing with the D.O. Devil G. Straight off the Back in 1995, a sequel was planned, named The Chronic 2, A New World Odor. Papa's got a brand new funk. But the next year, after contract arguments, Dre left Death Row Records. It turned out to be the right time, too, because Kingpin Suge Knight would soon face racketeering charges for his questionable business practices. Andre would go on and form a new label, Aftermath Entertainment, and reboot his career with his highly anticipated second album, 2001. While it was released in 1999, the album was forward-thinking, high-tech gangster rap for the new millennium. Even less samples were used. Instead, sparse, crisp beats thump alongside a talented crew of studio ringers. On the next episode, keyboardist Kamara Kambon recreated the theme from a 60s funky jazz instrumental by David McCallum and his trans-inducing keys are joined by a rippling low-end bass by Preston Crump and the scratchy guitar licks of Sean Cruz, with the snappy drum programming handled by Dre and his apprentice, Melman. The sexy rhythm seems tailor-made for pole dancing. The Doc and Snoop sound like they are holding court in a strip club. 
Over the mesmerizing melody, their casual deliveries matching the beat's trans-inducing flow, swerving with a luxurious three-dimensional sound. The vibe is legendary. Beyond the next episode, it's a whole nother level. Hold up. As dynamite as they sound, the scene is stolen by the heavenly husky voice of Nate Dog, who interrupts the song to sing an endlessly quotable outro, where he promises to We gon' rock it till the wheels fall off. As long as this loop is playing, we'll gladly ride along. The next episode is a bump and grind showstopper, which announced the next evolution of Dr. Dre. Ain't nothing but a G thing, baby. Too low down G, so we crazy. It's hard to overstate how unlikely it was that nothing but a G thing would become a top 10 pop hit. The Chronic was about as hardcore as gangster rap came at the time. The words were rough but real, confrontationally violent, and outwardly defiant. When you talk about rap crossovers of that era, then you'd be talking about the likes of MC Hammer or Vanilla Ice. Next to those goofy gimmicks, Dre was a breath of fresh air, authentically bringing the streets of Compton to kids across the country who had never dreamed to kick it in South LA. As hard as the words are, the laid-back breezy vibe of nothing but a G-thang is an intoxicating jam made to get the party started. The icing on the cake, however, is the exquisite chemistry of Dre and Snoop Doggy Dog. It was Warren G who had played Andre a tape of young Snoop, and when he heard his flow, he knew he needed him on the chronic. Dre would visit Snoop while he was in prison on cocaine possession charges, and even got him to rap behind bars when he first recorded the original vocals. One, two, three into the boat. Snoop Doggy Dog and Dr. Dre is at the door. All into a phone receiver, with jail sounds going off in the background. Snoop Dogg was a gifted MC, one who could rhyme rapid tongue twisters and then soulfully sing the hook. His relaxed, fluid flow fit in perfectly with the late night Cali vibes Dre was cooking up. On g Thang, the doc plays the melody from Leon Haywood's 70s sensual groove, I Wanna Do Something Freaky To You, on a mini Moog synthesizer, with a weighty low end and the in-the-pocket sample adding a bassy bounce. The duo busts rhymes about how untouchable they are, and with the funky beat riding, it's a total blast. Both men have rapped better bars, but never have they been on their A-game and having so much fun. The song's joy is infectious. It's no wonder this celebration of music connected with the masses. On Nothing But A G Thang, Dr. Dre and Snoop Doggy Dogg reshaped West Coast rap in their own gloriously stoned image. It's an awesome, eternally fly G-Funk anthem that deserves to be played at every summer barbecue. The album 2001 was first planned to be like a mixtape, with the tracks flowing into each other linked by turntable effects. The theme would pivot to unfold like a film. This makes total sense for Dr. Dre. Even more so than a traditional producer, he worked as a director, assembling the best talent and utilizing their best assets to make a creative vision singularly his own. While The Watcher kicks off the record, it's more like a prelude. When Still DRE starts blaring, it's like the actual title sequence starting to roll really bracing you for the ride ahead. Knowing his long-awaited comeback single had to be straight fire, Dre called in the best in the game to write his bars. Sean Carter himself, Jay-Z. At first, Hova penned some typical big money boasting bars before Dre gave him the thumbs down. Unfazed, Jay would write new lyrics for the track in only 20 minutes. This time, the words perfectly suited Dre's gruff, grinding mentality, all while exuding legendary swagger. The rhymes give a recap to what's been keeping Dre busy in the seven years between albums, from losing friends to keeping his ears to the street. He raps with a heavy, fiery flow, like he has a chip on his shoulder and something to prove. The pounding staccato piano, played by co-producer and former keyboardist for The Roots, Scott Storch, is so simple and catchy that you'll never forget it in your lifetime. The spellbinding line jams along with a swampy low-frequency bass, haunting synthesizer strings, and a punchy snare beat as the rhythm bounces like hydraulics on a Lolo. The words hit like Andre Young's State of the Union. He's all attitude, as he reminds sucker MCs who is still running the game. He sounds fearless, riding alongside with Snoop D-O-double-G and the cracking monster groove, making the track's energy celebratory and undeniable. Still DRE is a trunk-rattling beast of a banger that hits on all cylinders. With unforgettable Spitfire bars and an incredible world-conquering beat, it's a triumphant gangster rap masterpiece and Dr. Dre at his very best. And now, I'll add two more songs that almost made the list. 
Nowadays, everybody wanna talk like they got something to say, but nothing comes out when they move their lips, just a bunch of- I feel like a lot of people will go to bat for this needing to be in the top 10, and it just barely missed the cut. It's an incredible track, no doubt, but to me, it's more of an Eminem joint than a Dr. Dre cut. When Dre has other rappers write bars for him, they typically try to shape it into the Doctor's specific style. On Forgot About Dre, it's so obvious that his rhymes were written by Slim Shady. Dre's verses are delivered in a breathless bipolar flow that are unmistakably penned by Eminem. Don't get it too twisted though, the track still slays. The haunting strings and creeping guitar line paint an ominous, gritty atmosphere, paired with tinny digital hi-hats that pace the lurching rhythm. Marshall Mathers' tongue-twisting hook is a catchy dopamine rush that easily stuck in your noggin, and his bars are hotter than a set of twin babies. Forgot About Dre is an intense, house-burning classic, and even if it feels more like the Eminem show than a solo Dre cut, it's irrefutable fire. They say a party ain't a party to the west side. Gravitate to the dock like it's automatic. If you missed out on Dr. Dre's starring role in The Wash, the little loved remake of the 70s cult classic Car Wash that featured Richard Pryor, well, you aren't missing much. Some films are lost to time for a reason. However, if bad intentions, the banging Dre joint from the soundtrack slipped you by, you need to rectify that real quick. Borrowing a funky rhythm from the 11th hour's disco groove Hollywood Hot, it sexually struts with a floating flute line, a thick two-stepping bass, and sensual female vocals. Bad Intentions is a slept-on classic, with a beat as hypnotic as a narcotic, and it deserves to be mentioned among his best. Only the laws of supply and demand can explain the incredible success of this track. The world was so thirsty for new Dr. Dre that this became a smash. Did you know that I Need a Doctor is Dre's second highest charting song ever? Only behind nothing but a G thing? Not a single song off 2001 even made it to the top 20. Yet this made it all the way to number 4. Beyond that, whether it's because of the cinematic short film or not, it's his third most popular song on YouTube, with over a half billion views. Are we listening to the same song? The sheer amount of streams this got seemed to denote a final masterpiece from the doc. Guys, this ain't it. I Need a Doctor aims for an epic magnum opus. The video is over seven and a half minutes long, and the track itself stretches for five minutes, and it sure feels like it. And yet, at that length, and with the song named after him, Dre only raps for 50 seconds total. Not even a whole minute. Maybe the title was meant as a joke? I Need a Doctor is dominated by a grating, auto-tuned hook, sung by an off-brand Kesha. That's not even catchy. To pad the runtime, the chorus itself is sung four times, meaning Skylar Gray has much more track time on this than the guy whose name it was released under. The limp lo-fi beat is middling at best, with a forgettable minor key piano melody that sounds like the ghost of Dre's past. Eminem undoubtedly wrote all the verses. He raps for the majority of the song as angry as ever, eulogizing a man who is by no means dead. When Dre raps his verses, it doesn't even sound like he's that into it. He delivers the bars like he's waiting to clock out for lunch break. Paired with an overwrought soap operatic music video, I Need a Doctor is a lackluster effort with a weak hook and a pedestrian beat that I wouldn't put anywhere close to my list of top Dre tracks. To me, it seems overrated. The longer way to detox trick, cause maybe I don't wanna stop, maybe I don't wanna quit, wanna quit. A song so deep, it wasn't officially released at all. In 2010, Under Pressure would be leaked onto the net in an unmixed, unmastered form, missing the chorus entirely. The mixed reaction it received might have been part of the reason Detox would be shelved permanently. But the haters were wrong. This joint cooks. Dre, along with Jay-Z, put on a clinic over a futuristic synthesizer beat that pulses like an after-hours dance club. Co-produced by Scott Storch, his keyboard pyrotechnics are straight sci-fi. And over the anxious rhythm, both legends positively rock the mic, sounding like the pressure only makes them stronger. I'll say it again. Dre, release Detox. What are you waiting for? Under Pressure is a dope deep cut that still slaps. If you haven't heard it, you should definitely check it out. So there you have it. That was undeniably the top 10 best Dr. Dre songs. So, how wrong was I? Do you agree? Do you disagree? What's your list look like? Do you think I Need a Doctor is one of his best songs? Let me know. And if there's any songs I missed, let me know in the comments below. Hope you stick around, and thank you for watching.
undeniably the best. Ugh. What's your list like? The illustrious part. <laughs> Gangster rap came at the con. <laughs> Expected to stop and it's like, oh, it's got a brand new bug. <laughs> <laughs> now and after that, you're like, oh, it's gonna keep going. Oh, it? no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing but a G thing. A G thing. <laughs> G thing. <laughs> the thing thing.